Hello, it's 8 o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. These are our top stories here this morning. Misery for travellers as tens of thousands of workers walk out in the sixth national rail strike. I'm here at a quiet Euston station where just one in five trains are operating across the network today. Accusations of positive discrimination by the RAF as leaked emails claim it artificially inflated its diversity numbers. If in the past there is evidence that somebody has, deliberately or otherwise, been engaged in positive discrimination, that is against diversity rules and we will be investigating that and, and we'll make sure people are held to account. Holiday from reality, Michael Gove criticises Liz Truss over her tax plans and endorses Rishi Sunak in the Tory leadership race. Calls for nationwide caps on rental prices as rents reach all-time highs up and down the country. Coming up later in the programme, we'll be joined by all five members of STEPS as they celebrate a quarter of a century in the spotlight. Also ahead in the sport, Britain's Anthony Joshua weighed in 23 pounds heavier than champion Alexander Usyk for tonight's heavyweight world title rematch live on Sky Box Office. And coming up at a quarter to two, we'll take you through the morning papers with the journalist and broadcaster Badisha Mamata and the editor of Spiked magazine, Tom Slater. Hello, a very good morning to you. Passengers on Britain's railways are facing another day of disruption as tens of thousands of rail workers strike over pay and working conditions. It's the second walkout in three days and the sixth of the summer, with unions and the government reportedly still some distance apart in agreeing a settlement. Well, more than 40,000 railway workers who are members of the RMT union are walking out. Members of the Transport Salaried Staffs Association and Unite Unions are also taking part in industrial action. And because the strike involves network rail staff, all train operators will be affected in some way. Network Rail says only about 20% of Britain's rail network will be open and some parts of the country will have no trains at all. Services that do run will start later and finish earlier than usual. And it's not just the rail passengers facing disruption today. More than 1,600 London bus drivers are also going on strike. Well, our correspondent Sabah Chowdhury is at Euston Station in central London for us this morning. So, Sabah, another day of strikes. Is any progress being made between the two sides? Good morning, Anna. Not quite yet. So this is day three of strike action this week and the message uh, remains loud and clear from those at the picket line. They're calling for better pay, working conditions and job security. And this is what they're asking from their employers. Now, they're not the only ones that are walking out. They are joined today by tens of thousands of other union members who are also calling for the same thing, for the same protections for them and for their families. Now, uh, we are seeing reduced services across the country today. About one in five trains, so to around 20% uh, of trains are operating today uh, from 6.30 this morning to 7.30 in the evening. And this includes uh, cross-country services. And in central London just yesterday, uh, it was almost the, the travel industry was to a standstill uh, here in the capital. And that's because the tubes, most of the tubes weren't operating. Uh, and the same went for the majority of buses. And that is the same issue that we are seeing today. Now, uh, earlier Sky News spoke to Eddie Dempsey, the Assistant General Secretary of the RMT, about uh, the latest on the negotiations. And this is what he said. We've had some improved positions from Network Rail, which is one of the companies we're in dispute with today. Uh, but so far we've had no offers of any kind or substance from the 14 train operating companies that we're in dispute with. So we're in a very difficult time at the moment. Uh, our members are suffering in the cost of living crisis. They're facing a threat of redundancies. Um, and it seems that the minister is hell bent on escalating the dispute and trying to make things more difficult for our people. So we're in a very difficult place. 
So what he said there about the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps being hell-bent, that's him taking from what the minister himself said, uh, his words that uh, the trade unions are hell-bent on causing misery to society and, and to the wider public. Now, uh, I spoke to Mick Lynch, uh, the general secretary of the RMT earlier, who has been uh, the face of uh, these strikes, and he was saying that the future of his members lies with them, and it's something that is they are very concerned about for the moment. Sava, thanks very much indeed for that. Now, Sky News has obtained leaked emails that suggest the Royal Air Force has artificially inflated its diversity numbers to hit government targets for female and ethnic minority recruits. It's alleged that RAF recruitment officers were directed to prioritise the placement of women and ethnic minorities on training courses last year. Well, the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy says it's not true that the recruitment of white men was paused, but if there's any evidence of that, then the people responsible would be held to account. Sky's security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, has this exclusive report. Me, fly that thing. No, this thing. Attracting a diverse workforce is a priority for air chiefs, like society at large. Adverts such as this one is a form of positive action to draw different faces into what's traditionally been a largely white male profession. But defence sources allege the diversity push may have prompted some positive discrimination that could impact UK defences if some white men are being unfairly disadvantaged. That would be illegal, and a minister insisted it wouldn't be tolerated. No minister in the MOD and no chief of any service gets to break the law. And so if there is evidence of positive discrimination, the people responsible for that will be held vigorously to account. The RAF has been in the spotlight this week after Sky News revealed its head of recruitment had resigned over what defence sources said were impossible diversity targets. The sources said she'd quit in protest following an effective pause on making job offers to white men in favour of ethnic minorities and women. Yet the minister said the pause was for all new entrants to allow air chiefs to explore whether they could use positive action to boost diversity levels. What is definitely not true is that recruitment of white men has in any way been paused. It's definitely not true that women and ethnic minorities are being loaded onto courses now whilst white men are not. But a former fast jet pilot released this internal email on his YouTube channel. Unless Bain and female Tim Davies claimed it showed in 2020 the RAF appeared to be willing to hold back white men from taking an aptitude test as part of selection, though the RAF said the instruction was quickly corrected. This is positive discrimination against, against someone because of an immutable characteristic, which we know in this case happens to be their skin colour and, and their sex. It's, it's white men. It's indefensible what's happening right now within the service. In 2015, the government set a target for all the armed forces to hit 10% ethnic minority recruits and 15% female recruits by 2020. The RAF alone stretched the target for women recruits to 20% within that time frame. In March 2021, the service proudly announced it had met the targets. But the armed forces' own diversity statistics don't show how these figures were achieved – they describe the female inflow as 18.3% and don't provide a breakdown for ethnic minorities. The RAF said the discrepancy is because its internal data excluded women choosing to rejoin. Leaked documents give a further insight into how the diversity targets were hit in the year 2020 to 2021, with sources alleging women and ethnic minorities were brought forwards onto training courses early to boost the statistics. One file revealed the recruitment force continues to prioritise female candidates for customer relationship management. Another document sets out how the bringing forwards of some women into training courses early had impacted the following 12 months' targets. It read... The pipeline remains depleted of women candidates following the advanced loading of these candidates in the fourth quarter of the previous year. 
An RAF spokesperson said all its recruitment action was legal and said operational effectiveness is of paramount importance and no one is lowering the standards to join the Royal Air Force. The RAF recruits for many professions and, like the rest of the armed forces, is determined to be a force that reflects the society it serves to protect. The Royal Air Force has a well-earned reputation for operational excellence that's founded on the quality of our people. We will always seek to recruit the best talent available to us. No one's disputing the RAF's proud past. But there are internal voices who are worrying about the force's future. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. With 16 days to go until we find out the winner of the Tory leadership race, Rishi Sunak has picked up the support of a big name in the party, Michael Gove. Writing in The Times, the former levelling up secretary accused the frontrunner Liz Truss of taking a holiday from reality with her tax plans. Our political correspondent Liz Bates has the latest. Michael Gove is what you would call a big beast of British politics. He's been around a long time. He's held a lot of high-profile senior positions, cabinet positions, uh, education secretary, justice secretary. More recently, he was secretary of state uh, for levelling up. He's also uh, run for the Conservative uh, leadership himself uh, a couple of times. So his opinion holds a lot of weight within his party and within Westminster. And in this article for The Times, what Michael Gove uh, says, says setting out his reasons uh, for this decision. First of all, he says Liz Truss's campaign has been a holiday from reality and that her tax cuts will put the stock options of FTSE 100 executives before the poorest. Turning to Rishi Sunak, what he says is that as Prime Minister, he would put the strength of the state at the service of the weakest and provide millions of people with the support they need during the cost of living crisis. Uh, the other thing that's quite surprising in this article is that he also uh, touches on his own career and says that he will be stepping back uh, from frontline politics. Uh, maybe uh, quite surprising to some of his colleagues. Uh, love him or loathe, loathe him. As I said, he's had a lot of big jobs. He's been around a long time. There are many people within his party uh, that are loyal to him. He will certainly uh, leave behind him uh, a legacy at the top of British politics. When it comes to that endorsement, though, the question, of course, is, Will this make an impact? Liz Truss, at this point, is really pulling so far ahead of, in the polls, uh, it's really starting to look like maybe she can't uh, be beaten. So, no doubt, a big intervention from a very big name in British politics, but at this stage, it might just be too little too late. Well, with experts expecting the energy price cap to soar by 75% when it's announced by the regulator Ofgem on Friday, it's set to be a significant week in the cost of living crisis. Well, now Labour is pledging to review how the minimum wage is decided so that, in its words, they pay, it pays at, pay at least covers the cost of living. So let's speak to Labour's Shadow Employment Rights and Protections Minister, Justin Maddis. He joins me now. Um, Justin Maddis, thanks for joining us. So tell us exactly what you're proposing with the minimum wage then. Well, it was one of the great achievements of the last Labour government to introduce the minimum wage in the first place. But as, as we've seen over the last decade or so, uh, the increases in it have not kept up with the cost of living. And that's got us to this crunch point now where inflation is spiralling out of control and wages are lagging far behind. And there are about five million people in this country who are in work but are in poverty and we've got to change that cycle so what we're suggesting is that the low pay commission whose job it is to set the minimum wage will in future be able to take into account the cost of living as one of their considerations so that in the longer term we get to a point where the minimum wage is actually a wage people can afford to live on and pay all their bills what will actually change because as i understand it the low pay commission's remit requires it to consider the link to average wages as well as wider economic conditions already when it makes its decision on, on what the minimum wage should be? Well, it, it does consider those things, but this is a very specific request to look at the cost of living. So actually what people get in their pocket is uh, reflected in terms of what they're actually uh, being required to pay out. And uh, we know, don't we, that uh, wages are far behind uh, the cost of living at the moment. And, and clearly, something's got to change because uh, we can't have the situation in this country forevermore where people are in full-time work but are having to go to food banks, are struggling from month to month to meet their bills because that's not a sustainable way for us to grow as a country. We want the economy to grow. We want people to benefit from that. And one of the best ways to do that is 
is to make sure that the Low Pay Commission in future will be able to consider the minimum wage as part of their uh, cost of living measures. OK, so, so put a figure on it for us, can you? What should the minimum wage be under those kind of calculations now? Well, we're, we're not going to be setting the figure. It's the Low Pay Commission's job to do that, which is what they do at the moment. Well, but give, I think well, the give, us a, give us a ballpark then. Are you saying that it should rise by 10% because inflation is at 10% at the moment? Well, look, look, we're in a very turbulent uh, economic situation, aren't we? Inflation is, is possibly going as high as 14% early next year. We're probably a couple of years away from a general election. So I'm not going to sit here today and give you figures that will probably be out of date very shortly. What we're trying to do with this proposal, though, is get our, get our uh, minimum wage on a long-term sustainable footing that actually uh, ensures that those cost of living issues are baked into the considerations in future. We want people to be able to work and we want people to be able to pay their bills when they're in work. And I think at the moment that simply isn't happening. Happening. So should uh, the fact that rents are different, for example, in different parts of the country be taken into consideration? If you really are looking at the, at the cost of living, should there be regional differences in the minimum wage if you're going to fully take into account how much people have to spend to live? Well, we, we want a, a, a national wage to be to be set. We think it's, it should apply across the whole of the UK, of course. In different parts of the country, there will be different cost pressures. And actually, we, we would expect employers to be reflecting that in their uh, uh, pay packets as well. But actually, at the moment, wherever you live in the country, the minimum wage is simply not enough to allow people to uh, pay their bills, which is why we've got this cost of living crisis. So really what we want to do is try and break that cycle and make sure that work genuinely pays. So no regional variations, even though the costs might be different in different areas, just to confirm that? No, no what we, we we're looking to set a national uh, rate here as the national minimum wage applies at the moment, and we would, we would expect that uh, to be able to uh, deal with cost of living pressures throughout the UK. I, th I think everyone would agree that a huge number of people are really affected by the rising cost of living, but, but businesses are as well, aren't they? And there are lots of small businesses who are really concerned about energy prices, for example, going up. They don't have the benefit of, of having a cap on, on those prices. Are you concerned at all that if they have to pay higher wages in terms of, of, the, of the minimum wage, that could push some over the edge? Well, uh... One of the announcements we made earlier this week on the cost of living was that there would be support available for uh, businesses, well, uh, up to a billion pounds. But actually, what we're what we're trying to say as part of the low commission pay commission's remit is that, that they would also uh, still be able to look at the things that they look at at the moment, which is the general economic conditions, and they take evidence from businesses about their cost pressures. So those things would still be part of the mix. But in the longer term, actually, paying staff uh, uh, a proper wage is actually beneficial for businesses. It creates a level playing field that gets more money in people's pockets and it actually improves recruitment and, and retention. So in the longer term, it would definitely be a win-win situation for businesses as well. And finally, just before I let you go, um, another rail strike today. Will you be joining a picket line at all? Well, I've been on picket lines in the past uh, and I'll be on picket lines again in the future. But actually, whether one person uh, is on a picket line or not is, is probably not the real issue because it's the one person actually who needs to take some action today to try and resolve this is Grant Shapt. And all we're afraid we've heard from him is provocation and, and aggressive language, which is doing nothing to... Uh, uh, get the compromise that is needed to end this dispute. I would urge him to sit down with the RMT or give his negotiators the authority to sit down with the RMT to actually get this uh, dispute resolved. You say it doesn't make a difference if one person's on the picket line, but if they are a, a shadow minister showing support for the workers, that might make a difference to them. Well, look, look we, we will always have uh, great solidarity and affinity with the trade union movement and we will absolutely defend uh, people's right to strike. Uh, and I'm sure some, some members of parliament will be, will be re representing uh, their constituents on picket lines today. But actually, uh, it's a distraction from uh, the real issue here, which is the government's intransigence in trying to uh, uh, prolong this dispute rather than resolve it. And, and really what we should be saying to people, rather than having this debate about picket lines, is really what are the government actually going to do to try and resolve this dispute? That's what the members of the RMT want. That's what the, uh, the rail passengers want. That's what the whole country wants. And really the pressure and the questions have to be on the government. What are they going to do to resolve this dispute? Because at the moment they only seem to be prolonging it. 
OK, and the government, of course, says between the employers and the unions. Uh, it's, it's a conversation we'll have many times, I'm sure, in, in the days and weeks ahead. But, Justin Matters, we appreciate your time today. Thanks very much indeed. So let's take a look now at some of the morning's other stories now. And the government's insolvency service has said it won't start criminal proceedings against P&O ferries over the company's decision to fire nearly 800 workers in March and then hire cheaper staff. The sackings sparked criticism from trade unions and politicians, leading the government to cancel a contract with the company. In Somalia, at least 12 people have been killed after armed attackers took control of a hotel in the capital, Mogadishu. Emergency services told Reuters news agency that gunfire and two car bombs hit the hotel yesterday evening and that a siege is underway. The Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab group has reportedly claimed responsibility for the attack. Finland's Prime Minister says she's taken a drugs test for her own legal protection after videos emerged of her at a party with friends in a private home. Speaking at a news conference in Helsinki, Sanna Marin defended her actions and insisted she'd never used illegal drugs. Let's take a check now on what the weather's up to. Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the weekend will bring fresher conditions with showers or longer spells of rain, especially in the north and west. Southeastern parts are mainly fine, but there are some showers elsewhere with more general heavy rain in the windy north. Coastal gales are possible in the far northwest. A narrow band of heavy rain and gusty winds will largely clear the rest of Scotland and Northern Ireland during the morning while spreading across more of Ireland. Brighter, more showery conditions will follow on. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello, a very good morning. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. Our top stories here this morning. Widespread disruption is expected as more than 40,000 railway workers strike over pay and conditions. Sky News has obtained leaked emails that suggest the Royal Air Force has artificially inflated its diversity numbers to hit government targets for female and ethnic minority recruits. And former Cabinet Minister Michael Gove has endorsed Rishi Sunak to be the next Conservative Party leader and accused the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss of taking a holiday from reality. Now, England rugby player Rosie Galligan is, among other celebrities, supporting a charity campaign to look out for your maids and raise awareness of meningitis for those heading off to university this autumn. And Rosie joins me now to talk about her own experience with meningitis. So, very good morning to you, Rosie. Thanks so much for coming on. So, you contracted meningitis, was it 2019? Tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Yeah, so I was just getting ready for a rugby game um, in September 2019 and all of a sudden just went really heavy. Um, my brain was trying to sleep, but my body was just so irritable, um, ended up being really sick. Uh, and the next morning, woke up with a bit of a rash on my leg and my mum rang the non-emergency services and just explained kind of what was happening. And they blue lighted me in and I was in quarantine then for the next 10 days, um, pretty much unable to walk, um, in severe pain, really, like, really ill. Um, and it was just one of those things, really, where I didn't expect ever to contract meningitis. I didn't really have a clue what it was. So being able to now work with meningitis now, um, to be able to raise awareness on a campaign like this is something that's really special to me, to be able to share uh, my story and kind of help people know the signs and symptoms of what meningitis actually is and that it can affect anyone. Yeah, that sounds really scary as well, the fact that they blue lit you or blue light... What do you say? I don't know, went in an ambulance. Anyway... Um, as a result of your symptoms, did you recognise them? Did you know what was happening to you? Did you link it to meningitis? No, not at all. So I, I, I actually had a rugby game that morning um, and I remember being to my, saying to my mum, I don't want to let them down, I want to go and play rugby, but I'm in so much pain. Uh, I thought the night before I just had food poisoning, I'd had spaghetti bolognese, so I was like, oh, maybe, I, maybe I've undercooked something here. But actually, uh, it was the next morning when my mum came home and said, I've just looked at your legs and you've got a little bit of a rash. Um, that that could be something. Uh, that's kind of when we knew then that we needed to get some some help. Um, but yeah, the pain was unreal. I remember saying to the paramedics, uh, they said, out of 10, how painful, like how sore are you? And I said, 
in all honesty, I play rugby and this is the most pain I've ever been in. So I think that's kind of the realisation and the other signs and symptoms of the blotchy skin, um, headaches, stiff neck, like that was when it kind of all, all came together. So say that again, blotchy skin, stiff neck, Talk us through the main things to look out for, if, so if people are aware. Yeah, so there's a few uh, key ones in adults. So it's blotchy skin, um, stiff necks, headaches, fevers, vomiting. Um, you've obviously got the rash. And then one key way that you can check if it is meningitis is if the rash doesn't disappear under a piece of glass, uh, under the glass test. Um, that's when you know that you need to go and seek help. Um, so meningitis now do a really good op really good um effort at trying to educate people so that they do know this and that it can happen to anyone babies have a few different symptoms but coming up um to uni and and people going back to school and stuff and being with around new people it's really important to be able to like pick up on that and, and make sure that you help a friend if there is anything like that yeah and and uh, you know it's, it has really serious consequences in some cases, doesn't it? So really good to be aware. Yeah. You're pushing this out as people head off to university. Why that timing? Why is it so important, do you think, at a time like this? Um, so I actually think I contracted meningitis on one of my first uni nights out. I just joined a new un university for my fourth year um, and I went out on the Wednesday and I was in hospital by the Saturday. Uh, and unfortunately, it's just one of those areas where uh, lots of new people meeting each other, uh, lots of different um, people coming from different places, a lot of different bacteria in the air. And it's kind of one of those grounds where um, a lot a lot of infection can can come around pr pretty similar to COVID. So I think in this time, it's really important that it's not you don't always just think and assume that it's a hangover or COVID, but also knowing that meningitis is something that can affect anyone in any, at, at any age um, is really important as well. I and mean, you haven't got a mum with you like you <laughs> had who saw your rash and, and, and uh, sought advice. Very quick question about vaccines. There is a vaccine, isn't there? Can people just make sure that they've got that before they head off? Yeah, so I had all my vaccines as a child. Um, you get them when you're younger. Um, I think you can also get boosters as well. But making sure that you ask us up to date with all your vaccines and stuff, unfortunately, sometimes you can just be a carrier uh, and you can't avoid it. But, yeah, I think just making sure that you are trying to be as healthy as you can and and sticking with all all of your um hospital records that will help but I definitely was in hospital thinking that I'd accidentally missed a jab but I hadn't I was all up to date and unfortunately it just uh was one of those things right so well really useful advice this morning Rosie good to see you looking so fit and well I know you've had ankle problems which we can't go into so I'm sorry about that but um anyway we appreciate your time this morning and spreading the word about meningitis thank you very much thank you now, around one in five households in the UK are private renters, and with the cost of living squeezing budgets, rent really is a growing concern. Well, new figures show that room rents are reaching an all-time high in the biggest towns and cities, and now campaigners are calling on the government to introduce a cap on rental prices to offer more protection for tenants. Dan Whitehead reports. For London tenant Sarah, paying her £700 room rent is already a struggle. This is my bedroom, uh, my bed. Uh, I work in here as well, I've got my desk. It uses up 60% of her monthly salary. And like many in the rental market, she's facing a price increase. Recently, we, our landlord has um, written to us saying he's increasing the rent um, £50 per person per month. Um, it doesn't sound a lot, but when we're already trying to scrape together the rent as it is, it is a lot of money to add on top of that. Sarah campaigns for the housing organisation ACORN, one of many groups that wants to see more protection for tenants. What we want to see is caps and rent controls put in. We can't rely on landlords uh, to regulate themselves. At the end of the day, they are business people and they will take advantage of opportunities to make as much profit as they can. But a cap on rent is not currently part of the government's new renters' reform bill, which it says will create a fairer deal for tenants. The bill will offer more protection, banning things like no-fault evictions and giving renters more power to challenge poor housing conditions and unjustified rent increases. But campaign groups say it doesn't go far enough. Arvind has rented her room in Bristol for five years. 
The city has seen one of the biggest leaps in room rental costs, up more than 20% from the start of 2019. I and millions in the same position as me live with the constant fear, you know, we're only one envelope away from being unable to afford our rent. That is just the whim of a landlord. There's nothing to stop them from deciding they want more money and increasing the rent at any moment. But organisations representing landlords say increasing rents is not a case of profiteering. So I wish it were as simple as landlords getting greedy and deciding they want to make more profit. Actually, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing our members' yields, you know, what their return on investment go down because it's that much more expensive to buy a property. It's that much more expensive to run a business. So actually, where we're seeing the increases, it's to cover things like increased tax, utility bills, cost of management. It's not because they're protecting a margin. There are 4.4 million private renters in the UK. With energy bills set to rise again this autumn, they are looking for even more protection to ensure the homes they have stay affordable. Dan Whitehead, Sky News in Bristol. Let's take a look now what the weather's up to this weekend. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the weekend will bring fresher conditions with showers or longer spells of rain, especially in the north and the west. Southeastern parts are mainly fine, but there are some showers elsewhere with more general heavy rain in the windy north. Coastal gales are possible in the far northwest. A narrow band of heavy rain and gusty winds will largely clear the rest of Scotland and Northern Ireland during the morning while spreading across more of Ireland. Brighter, more showery conditions will follow on. Further south, it'll stay mainly dry. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, it's time to delve into the papers again this morning. Here with me to review them are the journalist and broadcaster Badisha Mamata and the editor of Spiked magazine, Tom Slater, into their third round, doing really well, <laughs> still with us, which is great. Uh, Badisha, we're going to kick off with you. Um, a story that's on the front page of The Times today, but has also made it, as you spotted, inside the sun here. Um, Michael Gove... Uh, some would call him a big beast of the Tory party. I think he qualifies for that description. Uh, he is backing Rishi Sunak in, in the race for the leadership. Yes, I don't think big beast is a misplaced term. He is one of the sort of mid or pre-pandemic big names that you'd hear about in the headlines all the time. And he's come out to punt for Rishi Sunak against Tory leadership rival Liz Truss. And he said that Truss has, in fact, taken a holiday from reality. Now, he's not uh, saying that she's gone crackers or anything like that, but what he is saying is that she is neglecting the needs of the poorest and most vulnerable in society because her, pros e her proposed economic plans really only tackle those who are already rich. So she's proposed changes to corporation tax and national insurance, uh, and she's rejected what she calls further handouts. But uh, Gove is saying that, look, this doesn't get anywhere near the biting point of the coming recession, the cost of living crisis and all the multiple, the omni shambles of deprivation and inequality economically that we're currently suffering. It's interesting that he would then back Rishi Sunak because Rishi Sunak is, uh, this is a phrase which is not often used of him, uh, the underdog in this race because trust is really pulling ahead to the lead. But the other interesting thing about Michael Gove's article in The Times is He's slipped in a rather plangent, melancholic side note, which is pointing out that he doesn't expect to be in government again, that he's enjoyed 11 years in the cabinet under three prime ministers. So in a sense, he's taking a back seat, a backbencher seat, perhaps, and stepping away from the fray, the rough and tumble. Now, in the extent of a career, 11 years doesn't sound like a very long time to have a career, but it's a very long time in politics. That does qualify him for big beast, rhinoceros or elephant status in terms of political animology, shall we say. We've all got fabulous images in our mind now. Thank you for that, Vidisha. <laughs> uh, let's move on to a different issue, um, shall we, Tom? Um, and it's one that we've been focusing on a lot in recent weeks, and it's about water firms. While uh, many areas are being told they can't use their hose pipes at the moment because of drought conditions, uh, a lot of focus... It, on water firms and how much they're doing about it. So what's this article tell us? 
So these are figures from water leakage from the water firms last year, and they lost a trillion litres via leaky pipes over the course of the past year. That equates to about almost half a million Olympic-sized swimming pools. And given the fact that, as you were saying, there was there's these hose pipe bans which are being announced um, across the country, there are various different parts of the country which have been said to be technically in drought at this point. Um, this, I think, is going to make a lot of people wonder why they're being asked to limit their usage when the water companies themselves seem incapable of stemming these kinds of leaks. Apparently, the worst offender here is Thames Water, and of course, that hose pipe ban for the Thames Water area is coming in this week in particular. And I feel like when it comes to the water companies, as it does with various other, either private sector companies in this case, or just other kind of essential services, whether they're in pro public or private hands, this kind of sense that the service is getting worse and worse that we're being asked time and time again to kind of manage our own usage of those services in order to keep things ticking over. And, that, and yet you see this kind of ranking competence across the piece. There's this story about the water companies. There's another story about the water companies in the news, which I don't want to mention because it probably put a lot of people off their breakfast in relation to um, some of the things which have been unearthed. But this, again, I think is just that kind of sense in which that pervading sense we have in this country at the moment, that just nothing is working particularly well. and that whilst um, Again, we're seeing increasing inabilities to, to deliver us these um, services. We're being asked to give up more and more. That seems to be the picture that's, um, that's forming a lot in people's minds at the moment. Tom, thank you for your sensitivity towards our sensitive tummies at this time of the morning. I have no idea what you're talking about, but I dread to think. Um, but, um, but Isha, I did notice you nodding your head there. I mean, this is an issue that kind of really annoys people, isn't it, this issue of, of, of water companies apparently not doing their bit? Is it a fair criticism? I think it is a fair criticism in the sense that whenever we ourselves as citizens are being asked to do something in order to solve what is essentially an infrastructure problem, it's very natural to turn your chagrin, your frustration, your ire back on the companies and say, well, you're asking us to be perfect. And by the way, I completely agree with the host pipe ban and the water limitation advice. But we then ask the companies, well, what are you doing? You're putting this on us, but have you been really perfect all the way through? So I think that's a natural tendency to look for a little bit of a scapegoat. I do really hear what Tom's saying, however, about that quality of, God, is nothing working? All these different systems and structures and infrastructures in various different unrelated fields are mm. being looked at with scrutiny and being found wanting. So that, for me, is the takeaway. This idea that we're arriving at a moment of crisis exactly when ordinary people and ordinary families are so hard pressed to do things themselves that relieve these various pressures on top of contending with recession, inflation, stalled wages cost of living crisis, energy prices, and all the rest of it. So the sense of anxiety is the thing, the thing that I really hear. Uh, I'm going to move us on um, to, to other issues. And partly, uh, Tom, I've noticed you've picked out a story in The Times, and it says hmm. Orwell's ideal pub could be closed down. And uh, I read through it and I thought, I know that pub. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> nice pub. But anyway, tell me the, <laughs> tell me the story. Yeah, so this is the Compton Arms in Islington, um, which is a really historic pub. It's been open since the 1800s, um, and it was frequented, I should say, by George Orwell. He actually wrote an essay once in the evening stand in 1946, describing his kind of ideal fictional pub called The Moon Underwater, which is in large part based on the Compton Arms, this particular pub. Um, it's been subject to a licence review because of four neighbours, it turns out, um, who have complained about noise and disruption. They've deemed it a public nuisance, um, despite the fact that this was quite recently named one of the best pubs in the country. So the idea it's kind of, you know, fallen under crazy ownership and it's, you know, become a bit of a, a blight on the area. It doesn't seem to stack up. This is an increasing picture we see, particularly in London, but across our cities as well where you essentially have just people kind of moving into the area and then being surprised that they're next to pubs and nightclubs. In this particular case, apparently the landlord has pointed out that a lot of people kind of got used to the quiet of lockdown and are now shocked to find that people are out enjoying themselves. And I think it's just one that, you know, we've seen loads of venues close in recent years, loads of pubs closed, particularly because of the pressures of the lockdown. And, you know, I think this is an example that you're not just losing a, a great place to go and have a drink, you're often losing a piece of history. Um, because of the fact that a few people 
again, a surprise to realise that the pub they moved in across from is actually open from time to time. So, yeah, a, a sad sign of the times in that sense. Indeed, and really interesting. I had no idea about that history. Um, Badisha, about two hours ago, I promised you that we would come back to an article you'd chosen we didn't have time for about House of the Dragon. We're at that moment. Take it away. <laughs> OK, everybody, if you like <laughs> boobs and bums and poisonings and murders and stabbings and dragons and some really impressive wig acting where the wigs are really carrying the scene, tomorrow on HBO and uh, related channels, House of the Dragon, based on the Game of Thrones prequel written by George R. R. Martin, uh, in a side note from making squizillions of pounds, is launching... It tells the story of, if you're not a Game of Thrones fan, uh, the blonde ones. That's all you need to know. They were bloody. They were incestuous. They were violent. They were very ambitious, just like all the families in Game of Thrones. And now you can watch their entire saga. I've already read the reviews of the first couple of episodes, and it does indeed promise lots of all the stuff you loved and hated and hated to love and loved to hate about the original okay. series. Don't expect subtlety. Don't expect to be able to follow the plot after about six episodes. <laughs> Do just sit back and enjoy the fabulous costumes okay. and all the uh, all the uh, stuff. We have to leave it there, but I really enjoyed that burst of enthusiasm we saw from you there. <laughs> I've got to say goodbye to both of you. Thanks both very much. Thank you.